Yeah. Brilliant. Well, welcome everyone. Um, and thanks, Reshmi and Tamsin, for inviting me to to talk to you guys about the renal station and the MRC PCH. Now, we're all shooting in the dark, and after speaking to Reshmi about it this morning, I, it feels like well, I don't know exactly what to expect from these exams, having never sat this kind of exam before, and no one's really sat these exams before, so I guess everyone's going to be muddling their way through virtual exams, but um, I suspect that as long as you're all sensible and you have a good knowledge base um, and know what you're talking about in general, I think um, that should see you all through. So. Um, I've got some slides here. I thought we'd go through some of the most common present, well, if you like, the, the categories of different renal patients you might see. So in particular, the childhood chronic kidney disease, dialysis patients, transplant patients, and um, patients with nephro-urological scars and operations, so urology patients, as well as at the end a bit of nephrotic syndrome. And um, just going through some of those kind of clinical presentations, what they look like in an exam setting. Um, and then also some some bite-sized teaching around each subject. Nicola, you've got your hand up. Sorry, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of it. That was an accident. All right, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. So I've got some um, slides to share, and um, please be, this is all entirely for you guys, so um, feel free to interrupt as much as you like, be as interactive as you like, um, and button ask questions. If it's more of a conversation, I think it's easier for everyone. Um, so can you all see that first of all? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me just. Great. So that's the overview I just talked about. Um, so if we start with the child with chronic kidney disease. So um, first of all, before we even go into the clinical examination, what does what, what kind of things, what kind of pathology? Chronic, chronic kidney disease is an umbrella term for a variety of different things that can cause chronically impaired kidney function. What kind of things cause chronic kidney disease in children? So right off the back, some of the knowledge that you might be asked. And you can be as you can be vague in this kind of in the way you answer this question. So this is just so congenital, so like just plastic kidneys. Yeah, absolutely. So um so Tamsin, you, you we, and if you want to to say that in a formal way or a way, a good way of using an umbrella term in an exam setting, say congenital abnormalities of kidneys and urinary tract, which is CACUT, and that makes up 70% of children with chronic kidney disease. So it's the main cause of um, uh, chronic kidney disease. So again, it's an umbrella of lots of different conditions, and we'll go through that later. Um, but it's uh, a host of issues from posterior from valves, dysplasia, reflux nephropathy, um, and and we'll, we'll 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 address that a little bit more. But yeah, so Kaka, anything else then? So that's that's the, probably your first answer that you're going to give as to what causes CKD in children. Obstruction. So obstruction comes into the category, if you like, of Kaka. This is something, if you like, a PUJ obstruction might be the case, or might be a posterior valves. But any structural abnormalities will will form that umbrella term of congenital abnormalities of kidneys and urinary tract. If you're talking about an acute obstruction, for example, like a neuropathic bladder suddenly or um, an infection that's caused or an, an, it's just a hemorrhage in your bladder causing blood clots and so on, those are acute things and don't necessarily cause chronic kidney disease. But in terms of chronic kidney disease and what causes an obstructive uropathy in a CKD setting would all be under the umbrella term of CACUT. I don't know how rare it is, but something like nephritis or yeah. SPS. It's as if you've already seen the slide, so it's, um, you haven't though, it's glomerular disease. So then you can just say glomerular diseases. And again, that's again, uh, lots of different rare conditions, but things like glomerular nephritis, um, or port syndrome, IgA nephropathy, these can all lead to chronic kidney disease. But if you like an umbrella term for your exams, you can say, well, there it's CACUT, glomerular conditions. Um, and then looking at more rare, you've got hereditary cystic kidney diseases. So things like autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, nephronophthesis, yeah. um, metabolic conditions as well. Cystinosis and MMA are the main ones that we can see in the chronic kidney disease clinic. Then there are those babies with neonatal hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy can have cortical necrosis and develop chronic kidney disease. And that's a growing population that we're seeing. Um, infectious, so HUS patients. Um, uh, all these slides, by the way, I'm going to share with you. So if you wanted to, to 
um, Reshmi can distribute these later if you like. And then tubulopathies again, very rarely cause CKD, but, but it, these. So if you like, this is like almost like a surgical sieve of kind of if you wanted to give the main causes of CKD in that order, I would always start with chronic cacut, uh, gumeric diseases and um, hereditary nephropathy is probably the main the main ones that we see um, and, and neonatal hypoxic injuries. Then in order to to if you like define CKD we stage it from CKD one to five and you don't need to know all the details of this for your exam but just to be aware um, we calculate your EGFR your estimated glomerular filtration rate based on your height and your creatinine using this Schwartz formula and then we can stage CKD from stage one to five and you can say that a stage um, a normal GFR is is 100 or more than 90 and then as you go down your GFR you you can stage at one two three four five and when you're down at stage five you're planning for dialysis or transplantation at that point um, so when you've got a GFR of less than 15 we normally we normally would would consider dialysis or transplantation around the GFR of less than 10. So it's helpful to familiarize ourselves with the, the staging mechanism when you're making a diagnosis you say well CKD stage 3 based on a GFR of um, a 50 or whatever it is that, that that patient has. So just generically if you're going to see a patient with CKD but nothing, not, not being more specific than that, what kind of the generic findings might you see on your examination if you're going to see a child with CKD? Um, Pala from anemia. Yeah, absolutely. So anemia is important. So, so they they can be anemic. So hopefully they they'd have treated anemia with with um, erythropoietin stimulating agents. So, um, but if it's untreated, absolutely they could be anemic. Yeah. Anything else? And um, short stature. Oh, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Short stature. Yeah, I keep shouting out. So short. So some of these patients are on growth hormone for their short stature, but it's, they're almost universally short. Edema. So edema, um, we don't normally see in a chronic kidney disease setting. Yeah, definitely in a nephrotic patient, and then a, a patient that is has lost their urine output and is about to go into dialysis or transplant might become fluid overloaded, but not not usually in a chronic kidney disease setting. Scars, maybe. Yeah, so thinking about all of the, they might have had a very uh, surgical abdomen with all the different nephro, as I mentioned, 70% of these patients are CACOT patients, and they may have had surgeries to try and correct some of their urological abnormalities. So they may have scars. They may have had a previous stint on dialysis and then recovered from dialysis and may have central access scars as well. Um, a lot of them need feeding aids as well, especially the infants with CKD. So some of them need high fluid requirements or need extra calories or just are too nauseous from their uremia to be able to tolerate fluids and, and the calories they need. So they may, they may, there's a significant proportion of these kids that have gastrostomies and they may have NG tubes. Um, so all of these could be um, indications of a patient with chronic kidney disease. Remember always look for nephrectomy scars on, on their back, they may have lost a kidney through a nephrectomy, um, so thinking about the flanks and, and the, the back. And then again, as, as um, you said, um, uterostomies, mitropinol, spesicostomies, and we'll go through all of those kinds of scars that you might might see, um, all those surgical interventions you might see in the exam case. And then briefly on management of CKD, so um, this is again in one slide, the, the main the salient ways of managing a child with CKD. Can, can people give me some indications of how we manage a child with impaired kidney function? Erythropoietin. Yeah, so you, so in management of anemia, so they, so again, these are the patients with more advanced chronic kidney disease, CKD stage uh, four and below, will, will sometimes need erythropoietin, yeah. Nutritional supplementation. Yeah, so definitely nutrition is really important. So, and we'll, we'll come to that. They might need nutritional supplementation, but in particular, they need dietary restrictions. So these kids are often on potassium and phosphate restricted diets, and they may have to also restrict their protein intake as well. So, so diet is a really important part of CKD management and one of the hardest parts for these children and families. Fluid management? 
Yeah, so fluid, you're right. You've got your ideas here that I haven't even put in my list here, but yeah, fluid. So some of them might need specific fluid targets. So often these kids are polyuric um, because they reduce urinary concentrating abilities. So they might need to, to have extra fluid. Yeah. Monitoring of uh, blood pressure and renal investigations so, and the iron levels. Um, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. So, um, so I think um, all of these are brilliant ideas and, and going back to blood pressure, I would, again, if I was going to try and break down this question, how are you going to answer it? So I would start off by saying, talking about what the modifiable things I can treat and the modifiable things to help him to, if you like, slow the decline in their kidney function, preserve their kidney function for the future is strict blood pressure control. So stricter than the general population, um, so less than the 50th centile rather than less than the 90th centile that you'd have for the general population, and managing proteinuria as well. So if they've got proteinuria, then we manage that with um, ACE inhibition as well. So those two things we know are renoprotective. And then the rest of the uh, the rest of the interventions, if you like, are the, the ideas that you come up with. So managing diet, so CKD mineral bone disease, dietary phosphate restriction, phosphate binders, vitamin D replenishment, sometimes they need activated vitamin D with alpha calcidol and then managing uremia with protein restriction and fluids, and ma managing anemia with, with iron and, and um, repeating stimulating agents. Someone mentioned calorie supplementation. That might be the case for some patients that need extra calories as well. And then um, short stature as well, we've talked about with growth hormone is another treatment that the, these kids are eligible for growth hormone as well. And then the last bit, if you like, is, so is preparation for dialysis and transplant, which is an important part of their management, the psychological, the psychosocial workup with these children and in, in preparing them for this next step in their, in their short lives. Um, so um, moving on to the child, particularly with CACAT, because in an exam setting, it's probably most likely type of child you'll come across because they have most of the physical signs that you're likely to see or be asked questions about. And I mentioned that CACAT itself is a wide spectrum of disorders and just to give you an overview of that that could be posterior for valves um, where you get an obstruction in the neck of the urethra uh, in the, uh, below the neck of the bladder causing a bilateral hydronephrosis um, and that's usually ablated at birth but sometimes you get late presenters um, you can also have physical urethric reflux where you get incompetent physical urethric junctions and um, and, and none of these conditions need to be in isolation. You can have a mix of different isolate. You can have vowels with reflux, for example. You can have dysplasia with reflux. So there are, there's often a spectrum of different things you get at the same time. So you get PUJ obstructions. You can have um, dysplasias and hypoplasias, just congenitally small or dysplastic kidneys. And then that can also lead to cystic dysplasias where you get small dysplastic kidneys with cysts. And then all the way on the other end of the spectrum is a multi-cystic dysplastic kidney, which is essentially a non-functioning mass of renal tissue that doesn't produce urine. Um, and having a unilateral MCDK kidney with a, another kidney, which is dysplastic, will leave you with, if you like, um, a poorly functioning single kidney. So you get chronic kidney disease as, as a result. Um, renal agenesis, where you're just born with a single kidney. Um, and then, of course, duplex pelvic horseshoe kidneys, these are other be like congenital structural abnormalities which can all lead to CKD. So there's a big wide variety and spectrum of conditions and the way we manage these patients is always with the same goal, preserving kidney function, preventing urinary tract infections by allowing free drainage of urine. So some of these conditions you can see are obstructive and will, will cause um, unsafe environments in these bladders for the kidneys in terms of recurrent UTIs which is going to damage kidney function and make the child sick or um, progressive CKD if it's not managed. So there are some surgical treatments that we can offer these children um, in order to try and manage all of these. So, I, and I guess when you're coming to the exam, I've given you a whole list of different diagnoses on the previous page, but if you see a child like this with a scar, you don't need to necessarily show or prove exactly what type of congenital abnormality they have, similar to structural complex structural cardiac disease when you when you come up with a murmur on and a midline stenotomy that that means that they've had heart surgery it's often not clear unless you've done the ultrasound scan what's going on under there so it's okay to say this child has 
abdominal surgery consistent with so-and-so identifying what that surgery is and they likely have congenital abnormalities of the kidneys and urinary tract and that's a really good start in presenting your your what's going on and it's, and it's important we can identify what interventions they've had so this this baby here what what do we what can you see here you can first of all describe it and then tell me what you think it is so descriptions are really important It looks like a stoma of some sort. Yeah. Um, could it be like a vesicostomy or uh, the ureters? What was that? What was the second thing you said? Ureters. Ureters here. Mitrophenol. Mm. So, so, so these are all good points. So you said first of all. Um, the cost to me. So first of all, addressing the Mitrofenov, um, you can see that this is a baby and Mitrofenov, uh, we wouldn't be able to put a Mitrofenov in a baby that small. So I think that's part of the clue here. It's not a Mitrofenov just with the age of the child. It's difficult. Mitrofenovs don't look very interesting and they can be discrete and they have different shapes and sizes. So it's difficult to call something definitively not a Mitrofenov that could look like a Mitrofenov in an older child. But for a child to undergo that kind of surgery, it's likely that they're going to be older. Um, so in a baby, you can say that this is a suprapubic position of this uh, of this opening. This looks like a stoma, um, and this is what a vesicostomy looks like. And then the clue here is the age of the child. So you often manage babies with this kind of um, this kind of uh, intervention um, to make the bladder safe, to make it freely draining. Um, especially for a baby with difficult valves or a urethral stricture. Um, and it's midline and it's in a baby, you'd probably say this is a vesicostomy, so that's your clue there as to what's going on. There aren't really many other things it could be in that position and in that age group. Um, and then what's going on here? This could be in any age, this could be in a baby or it could be in an older child. What can you see? Sort of fistula. The opening, that, sorry, Anna, say that again. It's like a fistula. It looks like a fistula. Mm -hmm. um, the opening looks, it's kind of uh, averted, but like, it looks a bit like bowel. Mm -hmm. um, what do you call a piece of bowel that's sticking out of your abdominal, abdominal wall? It's some, it's some kind of stoma, isn't it? Yeah. So it's so it could be that could be an ileostomy. I think you'd be forgiven for calling that an ileostomy. Um, it, it, or it could also be a ureterostomy. So in this particular case, because we're on a nephrology talk, it's a ureterostomy. And ureterostomies can be one of two different types of ureterostomies. You've got you can see here where my mouse is. This is an end ureterostomy where you just anastomose the end of the ureter to the skin. Um, and this is a loop ureterostomy, which um, will have two holes, um, bringing the bring the ureter as a loop, like you'd have a loop ileostomy, um, and uh, and that's sometimes useful as well for draining, if you like, both systems um, from one ureter. It so, looks quite large for a ureter. It looks quite large, yeah. So it's, it's so they can be really discrete and small, and sometimes they can be a little bit prolapsing and come out. And so there's no set pattern to how these can look. And I I think it's when you see them, they're quite difficult to distinguish from a ileostomy. The main giveaway when you look at it is that it's it's um, producing urine. So an ileostomy will clearly have um, uh, it will have a stoma bag with fecal matter coming out of it. This will clearly be constantly leaking urine from it. Um, so that would be quite quite easy to tell from that perspective. So if you see one of these with some urine leaking out of it, or, uh, and, and they have a stone bag with urine in it, then that will give you the answer. Um, and often, in, especially in the toddlers and the younger children, they won't have bags, but they'll have lots of nappies. They'll have double nappies and so on, and a nappy for their urethra and a nappy for to cover the stone or some special pads as well. So if you notice those kind of continence aids, then you'll also figure out that that's a ureterostomy as well so look around the child look at the uh, the type of, of what how they how they're keeping this area clean and so on 
I mean, don't usually use bags and children for for these kind of things. Normally, just continents, pads, and nappies, and so on. So that's what urethrostomy. That can be on the right hand side. It can be on the left hand side, as as you'd expect. Um, but in both cases, very good ways of if you um, of allowing for good urinary drainage of whatever system you want to drain, whether it's the the bladder or either either kidney which is obstructed. Um, and uh, the disadvantage of these two procedures is that, of course, they're not continents, so you can't be continent. These are these won't allow the child to grow up with continents, which is a big problem as they enter school age and so on. So they're fine for toddlers, where you can manage toddlers with nappies and so on. But by the time that child grows up, they'll want a more definitive procedure that will give them continents if they can't ever be continent um, by themselves. And, and different, you can become continent in different ways. For example, you can manage native bladders with intermittent catheterizations and, and give children catheters to catheterize at school. Um, and, um, and but then the, there's another surgical solution as well to having a system which cannot naturally drain itself safely, where they'll need um, uh, uh, the procedure. Can you, can you, can you tell me what that is? Or describe what you see someone? So there's there's a linear or a horizontal scar um, spanning from the left flank to the right flank, mm -hmm. and there's a small opening on the right iliac fossa, mm -hmm. um, and with what seems to be a passage, um, that be the mitrofenov. Yeah, yeah, and what is a mitrofenov? So it's a falsely, well, it's a surgically created channel access to the bladder for most of the time using an appendix or small pieces of bowels to create the channel where the child can then intermittently catheterize to drain the bladder. Fantastic. And what I mean, what's, what, what's the procedure often goes hand in hand with a microphone? So now I'm pushing you. What else might have this? What other surgery would have had at the same time as a mitrofen on the bladder? Um, they have some form of bladder dysfunction. So, uh, um, so yeah. So, so often these kids have a bladder augmentation as well. So not always, but they often need. They have small, thick-walled bladders which aren't very good at. A very small capacity, which aren't good at holding urine, um, and you can increase the bladder capacity with something called a bladder augment, where you essentially open the bladder like a clamshell and you stick on um, a piece of bowel in order to increase the capacity. Um, so it's it's not it's this is quite a common thing to go hand in hand with a mitrofenov, and the, and the mitrofenov here, just to show you an illustration of what's going on, you have the appendix here where you anastomose the end of the appendix onto the bladder, which you can see here, and then you bring the the if you like the cut end of the appendix out to the skin to form this channel to the um, abdominal wall. The main advantage of this procedure of a bladder augmentation with mitrofenov is, first of all, you can increase bladder capacity and increase the storage capability of the, the bladder, so you're allowing it to become a good reservoir for urine. But that especially if you have bowel attached to it, it's not going to be functioning as a normal bladder that contracts itself. It needs regular drainage and it needs to be drained with intermittent catheterization. So um, this conduit, this ileal, this appendix conduit will allow you to drain that bladder and it's also a, con a co continent system. It, it, will, it won't leak urine, which is really important as well. So you don't need to worry about um, the child doesn't need to worry about incontinence growing up. So that's the main benefit of a, of a mitrofenov and, and this system is increasing bladder capacity and also allowing for a continent system and, and allowing you to, to catheterize every three hours. Of course, the disadvantage is that for the rest of your life, you're catheterizing every three hours and also needing to leave a catheter on free drainage overnight, which is something, again, it's difficult to deal with, but a necessity for these children and young adults. So very well done for describing that. So that's a suprapubic horizontal scar um, 
with a opening at the right iliac fossa, which would be consistent in this case with a mitrophonos. Mitrophonos again come in different shapes, sizes, and locations as well. So these are all mitrophonos, and you can see one there, the right iliac fossa. You can see one here with a with a cavita in situ. But then you can also see, and more and more commonly these days, is the mitrophonos embedded within the umbilicus. So again, it's even more discreet and um, more preferred by patients to be able to cavitarize their umbilicus. So aesthetically a really good option for them. So you, sometimes you have to look quite hard for a mitrophonos. There'll be a laparotomy scar, either horizontal or vertical. So it can be, you can see this, this is a, a vertical laparotomy scar. Um, to fashion these in some cases. So, but yeah, so a, a um, umbilicus here, which is kind of, so it might not be entirely obvious to start. So you have to, to interrogate the, um, the umbilical opening to, to see that, that opening there. Any questions about mitrophonos? Last question, what's this? I know this is not a child, but I can find a picture of a child. Nephrectomy? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's it's just a reminder as well to always, when you're doing a renal examination or any abdominal examination, to say I'd like to turn the patient over and look at their back or look at their flanks, and um, that might be a cue for you to um, to have a picture like this shown to you by the examiners, and then you can say, well, that's uh, um, a a horizon. They're usually horizontal incisions and in, in the on the posterior aspect. Um, or on the on the flank, which would be consistent with the nephro nephrectomy. Normally unilateral, but you can have you can have bilateral nephrectomies. Of course, then you'd expect the patient to be on dialysis to have a transplant kidney as well. Um, why do we do nephrectomies? To prevent hypertension and UTIs. Yep. So those are those are the main reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and some other reasons, rarer reasons, we have some patients who, after the transplant, are so polyuric from having essentially three kidneys um, that we can remove the dysfunctioning kidney, which is producing urine but not not doing all the clearance it's supposed to do, and that can help with the fluid requirements that these children need because they can't they can't keep up essentially with their polyuria. Right, moving on to the next category of patient. Can can anyone describe what they can see? And then preferably someone that's not on a renal placement. Um it's um it's a catheter that's entering the abdomen. Mm -hmm. Um it's um, um it's kind of entering in the left upper um quadrant. Um and there's no sign of redness or inflammation around the, the insertion site. Um, it could be a peritoneal um, catheter for peritoneal dialysis. Thank you, Alison. Can you, before you go to say what it is, can you see any other scar up there on the abdomen? Yeah, there's a midline scar. Um, can, you describe. can you describe it? Oh, um, so it's midline. I can't see how far it goes up. Um, but it's, it's definitely kind of in in the lower half of the abdomen, and it looks well healed, and it looks like it's midline. It's difficult. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So it, it is a midline scar, and, and using the eye of faith, the scar doesn't extend above that little finger. So it's about a three centimeter uh, vertical midline laparotomy scar, um, and. And you said it could be a PD catheter. You're absolutely right, it is a PD catheter. And of course, with the exam, you can have that certainty to say this is a PD catheter without saying it could be a PD catheter because there's nothing else this could be. And the, and the big clue as to why this is a PD catheter is so you look at this bung at the end. It's a, a white, white bung, very long, with a blue section in the middle and then a white cap. So you've got white, blue section, and then a white cap. There's no other device that could possibly be. And we we train parents and families to very strictly not allow anyone else to touch this cap or to unscrew it unless they're a dialysis trained nurse or a, a trained parent to be able to access dialysis catheters. Um, and then this tubing again is consistent. I mean, it's very non-specific, isn't it? But this um, 
but this would all be consistent with dialysis catheter tubing. And then every dialysis catheter is inserted through a incision of two or three centimeter incision, and it can be anywhere on the abdomen. It doesn't have to be midline. It can be, and it can be, uh, it could be a horizontal. It doesn't have to be vertically. It depends on surgical preference. So if you see this kind of setup with a small two or three centimeter scar, and then the catheter is tunneled under the skin. So the incision, the insertion site of the catheter is here where the scar is. It's then tunneled under the skin and comes out the skin there. Um, that's a peritoneal dialysis catheter. So this is a patient with peritoneal dialysis. So that's re that's really good. Well done for um, describing that, Alice. And um, and as you go through the rest of your examination, when you think about that renal patient, you're going to look at well, are there any other scars which might explain why they've gone into kidney failure? So looking for those nephrectomy scars, looking for the sign of a previous urethrostomy or a sign of a mitrophinoff. They might have a mitrophinoff as well. Um, and then also looking for central venous access scars. Have they been on hemodialysis before? Um, sometimes they switch modalities. Um, so that's a PD catheter um, scar. And so just generally looking at the child and peritoneal dialysis, this is the machine they might have. So again, just to familiarize, again, if you're on beach ward and I was showing you around, I would show you one of these machines. And this is what a dialysis, a peritoneal dialysis machine looks like. So you can see these bags of fluid here. These are the dialysate fluids that will get instilled into the child and then um, you leave it to dwell within the child and then it drains out and that happens on a cycle over a, a therapy time that you set so maybe 10 to 14 hours depending on what you need to do. And we can adjust the length of the dwell times, we can adjust the strength of the dialysate fluid to achieve what we want whether it's fluid removal or solute clearance. Um, so that's if you like, that's called the Baxter home care machine. Um, so just to be familiar with that, just so you can be able to identify that as a dialysis machine. Do the patients do it every day? Yeah, so they do, this, is a, this is a daily therapy and usually at night, it's a nocturnal therapy, so they'll usually attach themselves on at night and wake up in the morning and take themselves off. And we can train parents to do that. Um, so a big advantage of that is that it's a home therapy. So moving on, Alice, as you just alluded to what the advantages and the complications of PD. So starting with the complications, obviously peritonitis is a big risk factor for these patients. So we're very strict about managing these. And as I mentioned, you're not allowed to play with the exit site at all. And, and any time there's a breach of that, if there's a leak or someone on a child chews off the cap or whatever, then we'll have to empirically start them on antibiotics for that. Um, drain pain sometimes it's a bit sore when you when the child is having dances fluid drained out of them and it can suck suck in some momentum into the catheter and it can be a bit sore. Catheter failure is a big complication as well, so just obstruction of the catheter, um, leaks as well out of the skin, um, and just malposition of the, the catheter should be positioned in the pelvis, but it can flip up to under the diaphragm and become less efficient. Um, Constipation is normally a big factor for catheter failure. So any kid that's constipated can cause any of these problems. So we're we're quite heavy on the laxatives for these kids. We we give them a lot of laxatives to, to loosen their bowels and keep them soft. This is, if you like, the headline complication sclerosing peritonitis. So this is not normally seen in children, but it's a complication of long-term peritoneal dialysis where the dialysis over a very long period of time becomes sclerosis and if you like unusable it's a it's a fatal condition in fact it's very painful and so on and you might see that in the in the older patients who've been on dialysis for many years and are not transplantable but it's, it's worth knowing that as a long-term complication of peritonite of peritoneal dialysis um, a disadvantage, if you like, is it, as you mentioned, that this is a daily treatment, and some patients find that difficult being on the, the restrictiveness of that, especially for teenagers. They're, they're stuck on this every night, um, and um, and it needs a lot of storage space. You need to have the space to have all of these. I, I showed you those dialysis bags. You need several of those bags a night, so you'll, you'll be delivered supplies and boxes and boxes and boxes, and you often need a whole room to be able to take all those boxes of storage. So. So it's an issue for some people who don't have that space um, and um, we often find ourselves writing letters to councils in terms of to, to get bigger housing or, better, or more appropriate housing for patients on dialysis as well. But the advantages is it's a home therapy so it's less time in hospital which suits some families a lot. It means kids can go to school um, and 
um, a bit less disruption to their daily lives, especially if they're um, traveling long distances to come to hospital. And again, it's an advantage is that it's a nocturnal treatment. So if it's going well, there's less disruption to their daily lives. So moving on to the child on hemodialysis. This is the, as you all know, the alternative renal replacement therapy. Um, so I've got some pictures here of um, lines, and I thought a good segue would be to just practice describing a line. So I think that's an important part of an exam, not just for the renal station, but for any patient from any condition who's got a line. So I'm going to invite you all to describe this line and tell me where it is. Again, it's not a child, but you can imagine a child with something like this. Oh, I couldn't hear that. Someone. So there's a. Um, there is an is insertion point of a of a of a line into the um just below the right clavicle um and um and it looks like uh, a permacare um and there is a small incision just below the right side of the neck as well where it could possibly be a scar from um, a central line into the jugular as a temporary measure before the line, the more permanent line gets put in. Um, so do you think this is, a, uh, this is a temporary line? No, so I think this is the permanent line okay. and then the scar above looks like a, a remnant from the temporary, yeah. This one? So, so um, well done. That's a, it's a really good effort, and you've you've called it a perm cap, which of course it is. We do call these we call these colloquially perm caps. Perm cap is a brand name. Um, I'd encourage you not to use the term perm cap when you're describing um, a um, when you're describing a line. Similarly, I wouldn't use the term vas cap to describe a temporary dialysis catheter line. So, I would try and describe it in 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 correct but generic terms. So the way I would describe this line is this is a, a central venous catheter. These are all central venous catheters. So it's the central venous catheter inserted into the internal jugular vein, or most likely the internal jugular vein. Um, and then you can add to it that it's a tunneled line, isn't it? So you could say this is a tunneled central venous catheter in the internal jugular vein. And that this line would be used for dialysis. And the reason why you know it's used for dialysis is because it's double lumen with two very large um, lumens with this obvious red and blue, uh, this arterial and venous um, coloration. It's not in an artery, of course, there's, that's, although we call it arterial and venous lines, there's no artery involved here. This is all in the internal jugular vein. Um, but, but to describe this in, in totality and practice describing this when you look at these pictures, this is a tunneled a double lumen tunneled central venous capita um, in the right internal jugular vein, and it's used for dialysis. Um, and, and I would leave it at that. You could say if you like, just to emphasize point, this is also colloquially known as a perm calf, but I think that's over the top. I think um, you're, you do better to describe the line and give it its correct name, which is a tunneled central venous catheter um, used for dialysis. Does that make sense? Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. You know the um, scar that's further up, right at the base of the right neck? This one? Yeah. So is that's that... a, yeah. So that's the, that's if you like, this is a fresh line. So this is just the access point. Uh, so this is just where they've inserted the line. Um, so this isn't, I don't think, to do anything to do with the previous uh, temporary line that you were mentioning. This is um, just where they have accessed, and there'll be a stitch there where they where they insert the line, and then they will have tunneled it under the skin to have an exit site on the chest wall. Thanks. That's all right. And you can see a nice picture here of where it, where it goes into the right atrium. It's a good position, or just outside the right atrium. 
So can you describe these lines then? So the one on the left is. Um, is this one you're talking about? Is this the left? Yeah, yeah good, right? <laughs> it's a triple lumen central line. Yeah. Um, it with a tunneled course. Yeah. Um, it looks like it's recently inserted because you've got the access yeah. point and it's still with the sutures in it. Yeah. Um, and um, there's no sign of infection. You've got a. Um, one of those um, antibiotic impregnated discs at the mm -hmm. um, and it's inserted just below the clavicle on um, the right side of the body like going into the subclavian vein. So Alice I think that was brilliant um, and the only two things I would say are different I, I don't think it's sub I don't, below the subclavian I think that all these insertion points are above the clavicle sorry. Okay. They're all so there. That, that, there wouldn't be a line that you would insert below the clavicle. That would be um, not possible. The only two veins you could go for are the subclavian vein and the internal jugular vein. I'm not clear from that which vein they've gone into. It's not always clear, so I probably wouldn't hazard a guess at that one. I would simply say that this is a, as you mentioned, a triple lumen um, tunneled central venous catheter. Um, on the right hand side in, in either the internal jugular vein or the subclavian vein. And um, there's no way it could be below the clavicle. So I guess if you had a bigger picture, you might see the, the anatomical markings better. Um, so that's really good. Now you can tell that these are small, these are quite small lumens. So there's no way this is patient is on dialysis. Um, this is a patient who has got central, permanent central venous access for another reason. So that could be TPN. It doesn't, by the way, this doesn't have to be renal, of course. This is for any patient with central venous access. And of course, as well, I'm sure you all know, this is what we call a Hickman line as well. This is the other name for it. And you're, you're welcome to say it again. We all, this could also be known as a Hickman line. But I think it's really important that you do what you did, Alice, which was to describe it in really accurately as to what it is. It's a tunnel of triple human central venous catheter. Could be chemotherapy, could be TPN, could be any reason to have a a permanent line. And the important thing about these tunneled lines is that they're permanent. By permanent, I mean that they're there for a long time. They do get taken out eventually for whatever reason, but some patients need, you know, long-term vascular access. And these patients, whether they're on dialysis or not, are on long-term vascular access. That's what a tunneled line represents as a, as a more permanent or chronic condition. What about this one? So, it's a double lumen peripheral central catheter. Yeah, peripherally inserted central venous catheter, so perfect. Yeah, so, and we call that a pick line, don't we? But it's, I think it's better to, to be able to practice describing that in exam. It's much more, more competent and professional to, to describe as you have done times. And it's a top double lumen peripherally inserted central venous catheter. Um, and that's as much as you can say about that again probably less permanent. So again, when you're thinking about the exam case and what's the underlying issue with this child, you probably didn't have picks for too long, but the Hickman lines you have for much longer. So what, what kind of more temporary conditions versus more chronic conditions that are you managing in these patients? Is this patient on a on a two week or a one month course of antibiotics for, for example, an osteomyelitis or something like that? Or whereas is this patient on TPN or chemo or or something else, long-term antibiotics for, for many, many months for eclusumab treatment for HUS, for example. Um, and then what's this? Let's so start with this one, this patient here. That looks like a central venous line which is not tunneled and has two lumens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely right, Rachel. So let's say, and, and you can probably go further and say, this is a right internal jugular central venous catheter, um, which um, has two l large lumens and um, because of the red and blue ports would be, uh, would be used for dialysis access. Yeah, so this would be for dialysis access or more likely for CVVH, which is continuous veno-veno hemofiltration. 
in an intensive care setting. So I, I think the important thing that you mentioned there, that it's not tunneled, or you can call it a temporary line, this would, would not be kept in for more than two weeks normally. So then you, thinking about this patient, they're more likely to have a an acute kidney injury, for example, a, a sepsis patient's gone to pick you a COVID patient or a um, HUS patient who needs some hemofiltration, any, any cause of AKI. Or it could be a chronic patient that needs some urgent dialysis access whilst infected, and then that will be changed to a perm permanent catheter in the future. Um, but but the important thing to remember is this is a temporary dialysis access, and that might guide you to what you're thinking this patient might have. And then on this side, not to labour the point too much, this is a left internal drug vein, central venous catheter, which is triple lumen. Um, and you can see how small the lumens are. This is not for dialysis. This is just a central line um, to deliver medications and so on centrally. But again, it's a temporary solution. It's not a Hickman line. This is something that will be in for one or two weeks maximum. Good practice would say all of these are less than a week, but they often get pushed up to two weeks. Does that all make sense about lines? Are you happy about that? And you know, you get these pictures. Do practice how you would save them at home and, and ready for the exam so that you can quite you know competently and and with confidence describe what your what, what lines these are and it gives you a clue as well as to what's going on again if it's a tunnel dialysis line you know they're a chronic dialysis patient and that you know immediately that's a renal patient with a renal station so what are the advantages of hemodialysis and the disadvantages of hemodialysis there's no role for the parent that it's all um, completed by the nursing staff so the parents don't have to take on a nursing role. Yeah absolutely right so it's a um, it's a in-centre treatment where um, they are coming to hospital three or four times a week and the nurses run the dialysis and you're absolutely right other than the fact that we have one or two patients, very special patients like they do home hemodialysis where the parents are, are so keen and, and, and engaged in their child's management and they can't have perineal dialysis but they want a home therapy, we can train parents to do home hemodialysis on some special machines and circuits and so on. So it's not true to say it's impossible to have hemodialysis at home, you can have it at home but it's very rare. Um, so you probably hemodialysis machines are very efficient. P peritoneal dialysis, again, you need to do it every day, and it's not always that efficient, depending on how long the dialysis is going. But hemodialysis, when you put them on a, a dialysis filter, you can get a lot of solute clearance in a very short amount of time, and you can dial in exactly how much fluid you want to remove. So you have a bit more control over the fluid and removal and solute clearance. And you also have four dialysis three days a week so you're not stuck onto a machine on a daily basis which again you can see as an advantage even if it's not a home therapy there are lots of complications to human dialysis so line infection is a big problem thrombosis again is a big problem so having dialysis and chronic kidney disease is a pro thrombotic state and so we we do sometimes get line associated thrombi we had some terrible incidences of right atrial thrombi as well related to these catheters. They're big fat lines stuck in your atrium for the entire time, so that can lead to, to complications. Long-term dialysis can have cardiovascular risks. These patients can develop left ventricular hypertrophy, and, and especially in the adult population, um, if patients that are stuck on long-term dialysis, it can be the leading cause of death in these patients having cardiac complications related to left ventricular hypertrophy, heart failure, and arrhythmias. Um, so that's thinking about similar to peritoneal dialysis, the life limiting problem is peritoneal sclerosis, if you've had that for a long time in dialysis, it's the cardiovascular complications. Um, there's more restrictions on these patients for fluid and food, for example, if you're only having dialysis three times a week, you're expected to have your maximum fluid requirement for the next three, you're not, you don't have urine output, then you need to be able to restrict your fluid for every day until your next dialysis session so you don't become fluid overloaded. Something that's really challenging for some children. Um, and so then we have to enforce a very low salt diet so they don't become thirsty again. So food becomes bland and so on. And then of course, as an in-center treatment, it's disruptive to schooling. But of course, in-center treatments aren't always bad. Some children have really difficult psychosocial setups and difficult 
situations at home where it's um, and there might be other child protection plans and so on where having them in centre three times a week is actually a good thing for them and they get much of their stimulation and happiness coming to the unit where they're cared for where they get uh, teachers coming in music therapists play therapists and then they have a good time so it's not always a bad thing to have an incentive treatment um, so just to remember that so these are the advantages and disadvantages of hemodialysis what's this fistula well done yeah, excellent so um let's be a bit more precise what, what kind of fistula is that because a fistula could be an a and sequel fistula of course as well there are different types of fistulas which is not that of course um a v fistula say that again a V fistula. A V fistula, yeah, absolutely. Arterial venous fistula, yeah. Um, and this is you can see here just a picture of how these these fistulas are needled directly by in, in you can stick a needle straight into the fistula. They've got very good blood blood flow, so you can you can put them onto dancers from their fistulas. Um so um I just wanted to go through quickly. If you see a fistula as your exam case. How would you examine a fistula and just go through that that whole scenario because it's not something you often come across unless you've done a renal job and even in children not many children have fistulas but the first thing to do when you see a fistula is to inspect the fistula so you want to compare both arms if one arm the entire arm is swollen if the fistula arm is all swollen then you'd worry that there's some kind of stenosis in the brachiocephalic vein um, so these kids that have had fistulas often having fistulas because they're long-term dialysis patients they're not easily transplantable anytime soon and they've probably had a lot of central venous access in the past and lost some vascular access in their in their superior vena cava distribution so um and so some if you like venous anatomy of these children is really disrupted so if you have a fistula and you increase the blood flow through your your veins in your arm then that can lead to the arm swelling if the flow into the right atrium is impaired by a brachiocephalic um, stenosis so look out some of these kids do have swollen arms um, and then when you're examining the actual fistula you're looking at the integrity of the skin um, if there's any um, erythema um, skin breakdown localized swellings you're looking localized swellings particularly pertain to abscesses or um, um, pseudo aneurysms so I'm just getting rid of something that's buzzing at me. So after you have um, examined, inspected it, you can ask them to raise their arm. And so fistulas are usually quite prominent. They're quite bulgy and they um, and they stick out quite noticeably. If it collapses when you raise your arm, so it drains, then that's a good sign. That means the fist there's no obstruction further up the arm. If it doesn't collapse, then again, it's another sign that there might be a venous obstruction further up the arm. The next thing to do is palpate a fistula. So if anyone has palpated the fistula, you, you'll you'll never forget the feeling. It's it's a continuous thrill. It feels like you're putting your hand on a washing machine. It's the only way I can describe it. It's a very um, strong vibration, um, and it's a thrill that. And if you're describing it, you'd expect to feel a thrill in both systole and diastole as a continuous thrill, um, and if you feel a pulsatile thrill, thrill like if the examiner says there's a pulsatile thrill um, then that might again suggest an outflow obstruction it shouldn't be pulsatile or it could mean that it's just an immature fistula that's waiting to mature these take after surgery a couple of months to mature and then similarly with auscultation when you auscultate one you'll hear a continuous brewery that can be heard in both um, systole and diastole it sounds like machinery and uh, that machinery kind of murmur um, and if you hear a high pitched systolic um, brewery, that again suggests an outflow obstruction. So, those are the kind of things you're looking for with fistula management. Every time you cannulate a fistula, you need to examine uh, in this way. And the advantages of fistulas so, why do we, why do we in, um, fashion these fistulas? So, often it's life saving for chronic dialysis patients, and especially for those that are not transplantable. So, the, in particular, thinking about children that have had, or usually adults, that have had one or two or three transplants. And it's very difficult to find an immunological match for the next transplant, or there are other medical reasons why they cannot have a transplant anytime soon. 
um, then having a fistula will preserve their veins um, and, and prevent all of the complications of central venous access, which do develop over time, and then you do end up losing your, your veins. There are problems with fistulas, they can cause infections if you keep um, an aneurysms, so you can get pseudoaneurysms in the fistula. Um, they can become stenosed or thrombosed, which again, big problem. If you think about where that fistula is leading to, it's going straight into your heart. Steel syndrome is where you're taking so much blood supply away from the distal part of the fistula, so your fingers, and you can have ischemia to your fingers because you're diverting the blood away back to the heart. And, and then um, there's some evidence that fistulas in the long term cause left ventricular hypertrophy and then cardiovascular complications because you're increasing the cardiac preload with extra blood flow. Any questions about fistulas? Do you have to anticoagulate everybody then? No, usually not, uh, unless there's a thrombosis. So if you've, if you've picked up a thrombosis, then sometimes they have to be on a course of heparin. I'm sorry, on warfarin. Um, we prefer not to have to anticoagulate them. These are, if they're working well, they're such high high flow systems that it's very difficult to form a clot in a system which is which has got such a high amount of blood flow. Um, However, of course, if there's a thrombosis or there's a stenosis, then that can lead to turbulent flow and clots. So they may need to be anticoagulated if, if that kind of situation is present, but we'd normally try and surgic, surgically correct those complications before, you, rather than anticoagulating them. So the next patient, I guess we've talked about um, CKD, we've talked about different types of dialysis and then different types of vascular access and fistula access. Um, the next, thing to think about is a child with a kidney transplant um, and and this is the kind of abdomen you're going to see you can't really miss a child with a kidney transplant that what can you can you describe what you can see would anyone like to describe that abdomen Um, so there's a, there's like a, there's an abdomen of um, a Caucasian individual who it doesn't look grossly distended. Um, the there's a large there's a large scar that um, that goes around the uh, lower left in the in the left iliac fossa, um, and there's also another smaller scar that is in the left iliac fossa that's slightly closer to the umbilicus. Um, both scars look well healed. Um, there's possibly a third scar in the right iliac fossa, which is not visualized well. Mm -hmm. um, there's possibly an additional, like an additional fullness in the abdomen on the left, in the left iliac fossa, um, but it's difficult to describe it without palpation. So what would you say? So I, I mean, if you palpate it, you feel a, a smooth mass in the left iliac fossa. Okay, so um, I think it's consistent with a kidney transplant. Um, what else would, when you're palpating a, a transplanted kidney, what else would you, what else would be characteristic of a kidney transplant? I've said it's a smooth mass, but what else would you feel? Quite yeah, it'd be a firm smooth mass, yeah. Um, be non-tender? You'd hope so, yeah. So um, so again, a healthy transplanted kidney would be non-tender, but if they had, for example, a transplant pyelonephritis or mm. a rejection, they can be tender. Um, it, it doesn't move with respiration. Um, so your, your, um, it's, it's your, your kidneys um, in your back do, but down here in your pelvis, they don't move with respiration. Um, so very good, you've palpated it. Um, what else do you want to do to examine that kidney? Um, I'd let you urine dip.
in, uh, in the exam would be to auscultate it li listening for a brewery. Hopefully you would hear nothing. Hopefully there would no, be no brewery. There usually isn't a brewery, um, but it's, worth, it's part of the uh, examination. So very good. Alice, um, you're you're actually right. So this, this uh, if you like, we call it a hockey sticks card. It's the traditional name for it, isn't it? Um, it can be in the left iliac fossa. It can be in the right iliac fossa. Chance one can go either side, and then you'll describe that mass. Can you tell me a bit more about these? You, 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 you've identified these scars. You described them. What do you think? Why do you think this patient has these scars? What, what can they be related to? Mm, maybe previous peritoneal dialysis. Yeah, absolutely. So you can see here that, that this is um, that two or three centimeter incision, incision I was talking about. So it could be horizontal, it can be vertical. Um, and then you can see this would probably have been the exit site for that dialysis catheter. Um, so although on its own, that scar doesn't mean anything, and that could just as feasibly be a pyloric stenosis scar um, for a baby, if it was above the umbilicus, of course, um, or um, it could be um, from an old ureterostomy um, or an ileostomy as a baby, you don't know. But in, I think in this context where you've got this pattern of a transplanted kidney with an abdomen, which has got a, um, a small linear scar there with an excess site, and that you put it all together and that's most likely a pregnant dialysis scar. It's just trying to recognize those patterns. Um, so that's the, the, the examination of a, of like an abdomen the transplant um, and there are some other um, salient things to think about so once you've identified your patient as a transplant patient then there are other things to impress the examiner with to think about when you're examining in general so um, we, part of the examination should be a thorough examination of the lymph nodes spleen and liver thinking about post-transplant lymphothrifted disease these patients are at risk of EBV driven PTLD or post-transplant lymphothrifted disease um, and um, and it's usually picked up with an abnormal lymph node somewhere. Um, again, looking oral health is really important for any child with immune suppression, um, and it can be also the focus of where PTLD starts. If you see any unusual lesions in the mouth, you can sometimes um, see them there. So making a point of examining the mouth is important. Um, anemia as well. So NMF particularly is an is a immunosuppressant that causes anemia, so they may be anemic from their immunosuppression checking their chest for signs of a CMB pneumonitis as well. And then we talked about Brewery over the graft. And then, if, again, again to complete your examination, thinking about other points of dialysis access. So do they have a fistula? They may have been on, they may have had a fistula from previous dialysis. Do they have lots of central venous scars um, from dialysis access um, and so on? Um, and in this case, this patient had a parental dialysis catheter. Some patients have never been on dialysis. Some patients are lucky enough to be like to um, be managed in the CKD service and get transplanted before they need dialysis. So they may they may not always universally have been on dialysis. And that's if you like the gold standard to try and get them transplanted before they need dialysis. It's not usually possible, but I say no, it's not always possible. Um, any questions about transplant? Brilliant. Um, I realise we're running. We've, we've had an hour now, um, and the next the next bit was just a little bit on nephrotic syndrome. I don't mind stopping there if you guys had enough, or we can I can carry on and do the last bit on nephrotic syndrome. Um, would you carry on? Carry on. <laughs> okay. You've got time. <laughs> just please carry on. Yeah, it's really good. Very good. All right. So let's, let's start with now the child with nephrotic syndrome. And traditionally, in the um, in the old MR. I say in the old back in the day when we used to examine patients in, in the MRCPCH and, and have actors, you wouldn't see an edematous child in the room. So um, it's not something I would normally have thought to prepare for, but they could easily show you a tell you a story of a child with edema or something. So it's worth knowing a bit about the product syndrome because I guess in the virtual world it's probably easier to examine. Um, so very briefly, this is just a quick overview of the product syndrome, but I think you all know what a nephrotic syndrome patient looks like. They present with edema um, and they can have facial edema, peripheral edema. Um, the areas to look for edema, of course, are in the ankles going up the shins and up the, and you go up the leg and you try and demarcate where the edema stops. And in some children, it, it never stops and it goes up their abdominal wall. 
and some judging the stops at the knees. So being able to demarcate the level of peripheral edema. Um, ascites as well, so familiarizing yourself with how to do an abdominal examination and examine for ascites and being able to describe that. Um, which is not easy actually to think about. I've not ever thought about how I'd describe how I'd do an examination for ascites. Um, why doesn't one of you practice that? Try it. Who wants to practice describing an uh, examination of ascites? You probably practice more than I have. I can try. Go on, Tamsin. Okay, so um, if the abdomen was distended, um, I would like to check if this is a society. So I would put my um, finger in the midline and um, percuss down to the left flank. Um, if I can um, feel like a, it goes, it changes to dull um, or feel, yes, yeah, something like that. Um, I would turn the patient towards me, so the right hand side, and then I would percuss back downwards um, to see if the level of the dullness changes. I think that's very good, Tamsin. Um, <laughs> I, I would yeah. say maybe the only, um, I, I guess the only thing I would say at the end is um, you described it really well, the process that you would go on to. I would say that when you get to the point where you would you would percuss until it becomes dull, mm -hmm. and then whilst keeping my hand on their abdomen in the same place, I would ask them to roll to their right towards okay. me. And then I would percuss again, and I would expect it to become more resonant. Okay. Where um, where you would have expected the fluid level to have shifted, indicating ascites. That's probably how I would describe that. Because okay. that's the point, isn't it? Where you you percuss the area of dullness and that mm -hmm. that border between the fluid level and the air level, and then you've asked them to roll over, and, and you've changed the fluid level in the time there. Okay. Very good. Okay. Don't forget to examine their sacrums as well. So looking for dependent edema in the sacrum. Um, and then a respiratory examination as well. They, they might have some fluid over there. You might find some um, reduced air entry on the lungs and fluid effusions and so on. Um, very good. So, um, so thinking about a case then, because I don't think, I can't imagine how else they would examine it, because I don't think other than the obvious finding of nephrotic. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention as well, when you're examining any child with nephrotic syndrome, a really important thing to mention is, are they peripherally well perfused? So do you make a comment about their capillary reflux time and whether they feel warm or whether they feel peripherally cool? And that's really important as you're the nearest assessment to nephrotic syndrome. So this is the case, a five-year-old boy presented to A&E at 7 p.m. with a relapse of his nephrotic syndrome. So he's a known nephrotic and he's had a relapse. He's very edematous from the hundred and twelve. Uh, protein of three plus for 10 days. Um, and he's already been on high dose prednisolone. So the mum's already started prednisolone at home for this relapse, but um, has been brought in because they're worried that he's still not responding um, to his prednisolone and he's becoming more edematous. Um, his urine output, you can see there's 0.3 mils per kilo per hour. His fluid balance after you've admitted him is plus 500. His heart rate is 155. This is a five year old, remember? Blood pressure is 75. And he's gained weight. And he's perfectly cool with abdominal pain. What would you guys like to do at this point? I'll give you some op options. If you notice, I haven't given you 0.9% silo as an option. I, I really would discourage anyone from giving a, a frankly edematous nephrotic patient saline because it'll make the edema worse. I think he needs albumin. Okay. Can you that? Why justify that, Rashmian? Tell me what type. Um, does anyone who's not done renal want to go? or? because I don't want to take a place of this. Um, because I think he sounds quite unwell, so it's been going on for a while despite high-dose steroids. Um, 
he's got reduced urine output he's tachycardic um so i think and peripherally shut down so um i think he's probably intravascularly dry hypovolemic um so i think he needs albumin for that reason okay uh, yeah very good rashmi you, you, you're 95 percent there absolutely correct i saw a hand go up from ahlam was that an accidental sticky hand okay so you, your assessment is perfect, Rashmi. This is a, a child with nephrotic syndrome who's become intravascularly dry. And I think that's the, the first question in an acute setting you need to ask yourself. So this patient has tachycardia with low blood pressure, peripherally cool, with prolonged capillary refill time and reduced urine output. So with any other patient, you wouldn't hesitate. You'd give this child a bonus. So what this patient needs before you mention albumin or not, Rashmi, is that they need fluid resuscitation. Okay, I mentioned that prefer not to use saline because of course saline is essential as part of your your resuscitation medication you know, treatments um but on the flip side giving 0.9 saline to a patient with half a of 12 and edematous is, is likely that they're going to pull that that, that 10 mils per kilo into their peripheries and make the edema worse and it might not actually help much in their intravascular space so you can give bonuses your resuscitation bonuses as albumin, which is more likely to be effective in this particular patient. So very rarely would we encourage albumin as a resuscitation. This is an age-old pediatric debate, colloid versus crystalloid, and it's been proven or been uh, decided that crystalloid is as effective as, as colloid for as a resuscitation drug. But in this context with nephrotic syndrome, we should be using colloid, we should be using albumin. So the question now is, which which albumin do you use? 4.5% or 5% as may, may, may sense, or 20% albumin? Given that he's intravascular, his pleat would be the 4.5 because um, the 20% is, is is less, is, you're kind of replacing his intravascular fluid less. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right, Alice. We use the 4.55% albumin, whichever one you have, because um, that's the safest one to use. So, And it's also the only one you can give quickly. So you can very safely give 5% or 4.5% albumin as a bonus. You're not going to cause problems, pulmonary edema, fluid overload, um, as you might do with 20% albumin. 20% albumin is a therapy that we give to tr correct uh, very bad edema very bad nephrotic syndrome but uh, when you're not worried about the intravascular space and you want to try and replenish their in their their albumin levels and try and encourage that edema to to dissipate um but as a resuscitation medicine it's, you can't give it quickly and um and it would be dangerous to give it quickly it has to be very carefully monitored over a four-hour period with regular monitoring of their saturations blood pressure heart rate and so on so as a resuscitation measure, you're going to give this child four or five five percent albumin, and you can. I would be happy for anyone in the DGH to assess this child like this. Say they're in shock, and say this child needs a ten mil per kilo bonus or five percent albumin, and then hopefully you'll see some improvement in their intravascular volume and um, improve their heart rate, urine output, and so on. Um, but you're not treating their oncotic, you're not treating their nephrotic syndrome, like it's not going to improve that oncotic pressure in the longer term. So it's just a difference. 20% the alternative is, is the, the, the aim of giving 20% in half a minute is to give them, to, to increase their, their oncotic pressure in the intravascular system to, to try and help resolve some very bad edema um, and um, as you give it, you might do an assessment where they are um, well perfused and warm and could benefit from some freezing light to help offload some of the extra fluid you're sucking in. So we often give James and Alvin hand hands in hand with freezing light. Um, and it, it's, it can cause pulmonary edema, flash pulmonary edema. Um, and so it's something that has to be, I would always recommend you do that in a well staffed ward where they're getting close monitoring from the nurse during the daytime rather than as a nighttime therapy. So it's ne never usually an emergency treatment, I would say. 4.5%, 5% you give it any time. 
So this is a similar boy, five-year-old Amy, uh, with his first presentation of neurotic syndrome, very down to his albumin 12, protein 3 plus for 10 days on high-dose prednisone. So exactly the same story as the previous case, um, in a sense. His urine output is 0.5, his fluid balance is plus 800, his heart rate is 130, blood pressure is 100, he's gained a lot of weight, he's peripherally warm, he's got ascites, and he's got some very painful scrotal edema. What are you going to do for this young man? Um, so is the difference he's peripherally warm? Yeah. Um, so he's not intravascularly deplete, um, but he's edematous. So would you consider frizomide? I'm really not sure. Um, I'm just guessing. Yeah, really, really good question. And 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 and, and so this there's there's often you you'll work in different centres and under different positions and you might see people just give frusamide to this patient and I personally don't like frusamide but and Adam has said diuretics first I personally not like to give frusamide to a nephrotic patient um, alone and and that's a personal preference I don't think it's absolutely wrong but I think if they at this stage their intravascular space is fine Mm -hmm. I think if you make them diuresis, you're probably going to dehydrate them and, and reduce it. You're not, you're not doing anything for the edema. You're not doing anything to help them move fluid into the right space. So you've got fluid in the third space. You want that to move intravascularly, and then you want to remove that fluid. If you just give them diuretics, you're only removing their intravascular fluid, and you're doing nothing for their their um, uh, third space fluid. Okay, so I would prefer to give this patient... And the main thing that swings up for this patient, so you know, often you can manage these patients conservatively and, and manage edema just by allowing it to resolve with the prednisolone. Um, but in this case, he's got ascites. There's a lot of you have to go a long way with your nephrotic syndrome to get ascites, and he's also got very painful scrotal edema, and that can be really sore for young young boys. Um, so I think once you go down with ascites and scrotal edema, you've got a good indication to give them some albumin, and then you can give them frizomide with the albumin and help move the fluid into the right compartments, and then and then offload a hand up from Sonny. Hi, oh, yeah, sorry, just a quick question. So, mm -hmm. with this child, so they're positive 800, and, um, and, and excuse me if I'm kind of being ignorant here, but if you were to give albumin, you're going to basically take that fluid out from the third space into the intervascular space. So at what point do you worry that if you draw out too much, you would in a sense you overload this child? Where, where's the balance between kind of saying, do I need to get some water off first before drawing water out of the third space? Or yeah. to take water out of the third space, then take it off? Very, very good question. So uh, so essentially, you, your examination, when you're examining, so you, you can do a good respiratory examination, listen to their chest first of all before you give anyone albumin and make sure they've got nice, clear lung fields. Um, and then also you're looking at their urine output. Now, I know his urine output is low, but he is still passing urine. So you'd expect that even if you give a patient with urine output albumin, that um, if if the, you are giving them extra intravascular volume, that that's going to encourage more urine output and help manage it in that way. Um, and you're not giving a lot of volume with this albumin. So when you give 20% albumin, the volume is quite small. But you, what you're doing is you're raising a lot more of their oncotic pressure. So then what you're going to do is you're going to be, you're like sucking in fluid into their intravascular space. And then if you give them some, with some careful assessment, some frusamide. So for example, if you see that their respiratory rate is increasing, or you see that their SATs are decreasing, then frusamide will certainly sort that out and it relax very quickly. I personally have not seen many patients ever giving them albumin have a problem with um, as long as they're passing urine, have a problem with um, reduced SATs or increased respiratory rate on, on carefully administered albumin infusions. So if you give an albumin infusion slowly over four to six hours, and then halfway through, if they're well perfused and warm, give them frusamide, is a really effective and safe way of offloading um, fluid, um, but also making sure that the fluid you're offloading is not just from the intravascular space, that it's sucked in from the third space and then and then not it in that way. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Very good. Um, any other questions about the, about the difference in the types of management is out there and so on? Great. And as I said, uh, try and avoid saline viruses in these patients. So, you, you know, it usually treats the physician, but not the child. Um, I have one question, Nabil, mm -hmm. sorry. Of course, yeah. Um, yes. in, in an acute setting where mm -hmm. you need to fluid resuscitate a child it, with nephrotic, but you can't get your hands on albumin fast enough, what yeah. other fluids can you use? Well, can I you do so, I, I, you know, I would despair at any resuscitation department that doesn't have 5% uh, album. Um, but if you don't, then, um, because it should be readily available, it should be there in every modern hospital. But um, if it's not there, then of course you, you have to save the child's life and, and give them saline. life. But I, I think it's, you know, it, you're, you're going to be fighting a losing pattern if you're continuing with saline in a patient who's, who's shocked with nephrotic syndrome. Thanks. Maybe just transfer them to a tertiary centre at that point. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, but that's not usually a problem. And you say most 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 centres have um, access to. And of course, not many patients present like this anymore. Most patients, and especially in the developed world, they they come in earlier than, than when they're in shock. But it does still happen. Concentration of albumin for this scenario. Um, so. Are you meaning 20% or the dose of 20% albumin? So normally use 0.5 to 1 gram per kilogram of albumin, but 20% for this last scenario. Very good. So I just wanted to briefly talk about, so these are, I've talked to you about the acute management of, a, of an endematous patient with nephrotic syndrome, but more of the, uh, the, the treatments that we have. So we, you, you, you all know that prednisolone is the mainstay of treatment. You have a child presenting with, with nephrotic syndrome. It, the main treatment is always prednisolone, vast majority respond to prednisolone, and the initial treatment course is a, is, is a standard course of um, 60 milligrams per meter squared for four weeks and then 40 milligrams per meter squared on alternate days for a further four weeks, and then you can stop. And there aren't many therapies and management regimes in pediatrics in general, which are very strongly evidence-based, but this is one of the few areas which is very strongly evidence-based. And this is based on a recent multi-center trial, the largest pediatric trial in the UK with over 300 centers uh, called the PREDNOS trial, which looked at the dose of steroids for initial presentation, and particularly the length of treatment. So, um, eight weeks versus 16 weeks, and it showed no benefit of a prolonged course for their initial presentation. So this is, if you like, now written in stone that this is the treatment course for an initial presentation of nephrotic syndrome. And it's useful just to be able to reference, I, 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 you don't have to know all this in detail, but for an exam to say, if you're having that discussion with the examiner, you can say, Prednoscott trial, which was published in 2019, shows that the best course of treatment would be um, eight weeks, um, 60 milligrams per meter squared for four weeks, followed by 40 milligrams per meter squared, alternatives for another four weeks for the initial presentation. Then you can use less steroid for subsequent presentation. Um, so that's most of your children that are going to respond to that kind of treatment. Um, also, if you notice in this graph, you can see this is this is the um, uh, this is the risk of relapse. In both groups, so the long run, well, eighty percent of your kids by by two years have relapsed. So most kids do relapse in nephrotic syndrome in the UK um, after an initial presentation. So when you're counselling parents or you're talking to the examiner, you can always say that it's four out of five children um, statistically will have a relapse in the future, and will need further courses of prednisolone. And so then. It's up to us as pediatricians to decide which of those kids need further immunosuppression and which of them can be managed with intermittent courses of steroid. And do you know, can anyone tell me the scenarios where you want to escalate to a nephrologist and say they need more immunosuppression than just prednisone? If after their first four weeks of treatment, they, um, they still have proteinuria? Yeah, so that's you're talking there for about a steroid resistant nephrotic. 
Yeah, so that's a particular category of children who are steroid, steroid resistant necrotic syndromes, those that have not responded to treatment after a month. So you've got steroid resistant nephrotics, any other type of nephrotics? So if the GFR begins to go down as well? So, so that's uh, so now we're talking about the, a, a difference in presentation. So that's mm -hmm. an atypical presentation. So I'm going to come to that in a second. So forget the if you like the atypical features, which are difference in ages, hematuria, GFR, and so on. Thinking just about how we classify their if you like is their response to steroids is how we classify nephrotics, isn't it? So, so you, you got if you like there are four different categories for nephrotic syndrome. You've got the infrequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome, um, which are those that relapse less than four times a year. You've got the frequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome. And I said SSNS, which is steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome. Um, so they relapse more than four times a year, more than twice every six months. Um, and then the steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome. So those that respond to steroid, but but relapse as soon as you wean off to so the ones that need to remain on um, steroids and the steroid resistant nephrotic syndromes, those that don't respond to steroid at all. And the steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome may have been steroid sensitive in the past and then it's become steroid resistant in the future. That can happen as well sometimes. But essentially, these three categories your frequent relapses, your steroid dependent and your steroid resistant nephrotic syndromes, these are the ones that need escalation of therapy to try and reduce their steroid burden and, and, and try other immunosuppressants. And then just to briefly go over the different options you have, you have the Vamasol, um, which can work, it works better in the South Asian population. Um, so we tend to try it in those in that population where it works less well in the Caucasian population, so it isn't used as much. Um, MMF as well is a good option that we use. It can uh, prevent um, relapses in two thirds of that frequent relapsing population. Tacrolimus, so we don't use cyclosporine anymore because CNI inhibitors, calcineurin inhibitors, um, of which tacrolimus and cyclosporine are both um, do the same thing. There's no, there's no superiority of one over the other, but cyclosporine has lots of side effects that are undesirable, such as hypertrichosis in, in girls and um, become hypertrophy. So we try not to use um, cyclosporine anymore. Um, they are both tacrolimus and cyclosporine nephrotoxic in the long term. So it's an ironic thing that we're treating a kidney problem with a nephrotoxic agent. Um, we don't really use cyclophosphamide anymore because again, it's not, it's got some nasty side effects and especially thinking about fertility of young girls, but um, rituximab, an anti-B cell treatment, something that's been used for the last 20 years, good effect. So that's usually the last line, an effective agent in these patients. So that's just a, you know, a whistle-stop tour of those kind of second-line agents, just in case you have that discussion with the examiner about what's next for this patient if they're frequently relapsing or steroid resistant. And then also, if you're having a discussion about prognosis, because people get hung up about, um, oh, if it's an FSGS or if it's a minimal change or just angio proliferation, what? what what's the likely prognosis and actually you can always forget about the histology and 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 we can we can lead ourselves down a blind alley when we're talking about histology we, we do sometimes biopsy these patients when we're really stuck and have um, difficult and atypical presentations but um the histology doesn't usually correlate to future outcomes your your prognosis is usually directly related to how sensitive you are to steroids. So if, if you're on a lot of immunosuppression, but you respond very well to steroids, then it's a good sign that you'll grow out of it at some point. Um, whereas if you are resistant to steroids or dependent upon steroids, then that makes it um, less likely, not impossible, less likely that you're, you're going to be free of nephrotic syndrome in adulthood. Um, so yeah, just just cement that into your minds, I guess the steroid sensitivity is is what what will determine your future outcome in these patients. And then um, one of you mentioned some atypical features. So again, other reasons to refer to a nephrologist to think about atypical reasons for um, to escalate treatment or to biopsy looking for other diagnoses as well. So um, as you mentioned, steroid resistance having macroscopic hematuria, so only frank blood in the urine is again a, an immediate 
cause for concern. It shouldn't, that shouldn't be seen in a childhood onset necrotic syndrome. Microscopic hematuria. Uh, it's a bit of an odd one, that one, because although that's what people say, they shouldn't have any blood, 20% of nephrotics present with microscopic hematuria. So um, it's not usually there, but it can be there. Um, hypertension and rise in creatinine or impaired GFR, as you mentioned earlier. These are all atypical features of childhood onset necrotic syndrome that need further investigation. That age range less than two years old or over 10 years old. Extra renal symptoms, rashes, joint pains, eye symptoms, um, all would indicate that we need to biopsy that patient and think of other diagnoses such as lupus or other immune mediated conditions. And that's that's everything. So um, longer than I expected, but um, does anyone have any questions or anything you want to ask? Uh, I have one, sorry. Mm. With the nephrotic syndrome, do we do anything like antibiotics or um, special advice um, during a relapse yeah, to your family? Yeah, you're absolutely right. right. And um, I completely lost over, missed out completely. So, um, if you are edematous and you're having a relapse with edema, then we would advise to be on PEN-V for the duration of the course in which you're edematous. So although you are going to, your edema should resolve on prednisolone, and although you might have to continue prednisolone for longer, you can stop your penicillin as soon as you your edema resolves. And then we also advise omeprazole for high-dose prednisolone as well. Although I know that if you're from North London and you ask for advice from Great Ormond Street, they wouldn't um, advise penicillin. So just as a, as a caveat there, um, but uh, I think most centres do give penicillin. And what about going back to school or can they do PE and all of that stuff? Uh, yeah, there's no reason they shouldn't be going to school in any of these conditions, unless they're so edematous they're in pain, but um, they, 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 they all can attend school as well. Okay, thank you. Although COVID put a spanner in that, so we, we we did advise, again, we had to make it all up for COVID, didn't we? But we said if you're on high dose steroids and another immunosuppressant, then you should shield. Anyone else? Anything else? Was that helpful for anyone sitting the exam, do you think? Yeah, super helpful. Good. It was really, really useful. Thank you so much. Good. Good, so thank you so much, Matthew. That's all right, and good luck all of your exams. I'm sure you'll do great. Um, you, all, you all came up with very good answers. Everything, so. Thank you, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thanks. 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 Thanks.